glorious king such an amazing thing to see all of you this morning you guys look amazing you look handsome and beautiful look at the person next to you tell them if it's a guy say you look handsome if it's a lady say you look beautiful man tell them it's like i've almost never seen you before it looks like it's your first time with that smile on your face indeed because our captivity is over I want to postulate my honor to the angel of God upon this commission the prophet of God Dr. Ian Lovu please celebrate him I thought you would stand and celebrate the man of God man of God we honor you with your dear wife Mama Angel Glovu, all the way in Bulawayo. I, I believe they're not in Bulawayo today, they're ministering elsewhere. Please, you may have your seats again. Thank you for honoring who God has sent. The Bible says, You give honor to whom honor is due, it's absolutely critical. I also want to honor the leadership of Divine Kingdom Baptist Ministries International all the way from Bulawayo to the Nairobi Commission here from the Chairman to the Secretary General to every other leader that God has positioned over this commission. Please celebrate them. <clears throat> Please celebrate them again properly. The Lord. Lord has made it easy for ministry to be executed because of them. Today I want to be to deploy a matter that is critical in the heart of God. You know one of the things that I've consistently seen with God is that his generosity sometimes and most of the times is not dictated by the condition of our hearts. But he gives us liberty and freedom from our oppressors that we have submitted our worship to in expectance that we are going to love him freely. So God says, come as you are. And come as you are, it means you're in the bondage by which you submitted your worship to and your heart to. When God says, come as you are, he's aware that your heart is currently not with him. The liberty and the freedom is from him, but your heart is elsewhere. And your worship is elsewhere. Because God knows that which is pleasing you is brutal. And the reason why it's pleasing you, the reason why it's giving you sweet nothings, whispering to you sweet nothings, is so that it can kill, steal, and destroy. And God hates the death of his people. Even though spiritual principles are spiritual principles. From last Sunday, we started learning about the Passover and the death and the resurrection of the Messiah, which historically, sits within the month that we celebrate Passover. And this year is from the April 22nd to 24th. Now, even in studying the Passover, one of the things that we have to study is Jesus as our Passover. Yeshua, our Passover. Or Jesus as our Passover lamb. Now, it's extremely important for you to study this even in your personal time. There are a lot of materials everywhere, all over the place. You can get them all over the place. But I beg you that it is imperative for you to understand what is God saying in this specific time. Because in the days of ancient, at this particular time, the ravages of his wrath were being experienced in Egypt. At this particular time, if you're living in the ancient Egypt, 
whether you are an Egyptian or an Israeli or a Jew, whether you are a trader, possibly coming from this side of town, Ethiopia and Kenya, and you're in Egypt, you would have experienced the wrath of God, where God himself decided to corrupt and recreate his own creation so that he can be able to show the powers of the day his true eminence. And how jealous he is to rescue his lover from bondage. One of the things I need to tell you is that unknowingly God has been hitting your enemy with all kinds of plagues so that the enemy can release you. Altars of wickedness and witchcraft. The reason why you have survived necessarily is not because of your prayer. It's not because of your cute or handsome face. It's not because of your degree or the fact that you're in Nairobi, what Wamta city. It's because the king is jealous of you. But the king is also aware of where your heart is. The king is aware where you're taking your treasure, where you're taking your time, and where you're taking your talent. He's aware. But whatever covenant it is that has been speaking darkness against you, it has received not one or two attacks from the king, but man, many, many, many attacks of the king so that they can be able to let you go and that coven will never be able to rise. The speakings of that contrary altar that speaks things against your life will never be able to exercise its authority over you and you'll be free to worship the king. But your freedom can never come unless your will is submitted to the king of kings. The scenario in ancient Egypt is God took care of all gods of ancient Egypt. But the Israelis, they never let the gods go. The gods let them go, but they never let the gods go. God can save you from something, but you still hold on to it. God can crush your enemy, but you still hold on to the doctrine of the enemy. And all through the liberation, they never held on to God. They held on to other gods. What a tragedy. That God has executed. God has put up a spectacular, stellar show of his people. You are sure that these were the workings of God. But they still held on to their idols. A little God and a little something else. And that's why today God has told me to speak about a sensitive matter that is happening with his people. He told me to speak about idolatry. Say idolatry. Say idolatry. I don't know whether you're ready for me today. But I pray that you are. Because God really wants to speak to you about idolatry. Sincerely speaking. The one thing that the king wants is that you dispossess that which you worship. That is not of him. Or that is not him. The one thing that God is demanding is exclusive worship and submission to him. God is asking, let my people put their full hope in me. Not in their governments, not in their education, not in their connections, not in any vain thing. Let them pull, put their full hope in me. And therefore, I pray that I execute this in the least possible time. And I'll start the anchor lesson today is in Ezekiel 20. In Ezekiel 20, you'll see the rebellions of Israel. 
For those of you who don't like long verses, please forgive me because this one is going to be a long one. Because it's going to be a long one. I'm going to start with a long one so that I can lay a strong basis on our conversation and the lessons today. Tell the person next to you, open your heart to teaching. This is a church that is led by a teacher. It's more important to teach than to prophesy. Ezekiel 20, Rebellions of Israel. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, Son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. Say to them, that says the Lord, on the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in the oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt and to the land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Then I said to them, each of you, throw away the abominations which are before his eyes and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, but they rebelled against me and will not obey me. They did not cast all away the abominations which were before their eyes. Nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles, before whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. I will read until there today. But I want you to go back home in your own personal study. And you need to read the entire Ezekiel 20 to understand the heart of, the, the heart of God. That at that particular time, God had saved them from the idols, from Egypt, from captivity, from the Pharaoh. But the Israelites were still hanging on to their gods. Their salvation was from God, but the worship was to their gods. Their salvation was from God, but they postulated and worshipped their gods or other gods. And this angered God so greatly and he said, I'm going to destroy these little demons. Why do they keep on doing this to me? But he failed to do so for his own reputation. Otherwise, the ones that he had saved them from will say that he's a terrible God. So out of, own, out of his, his own reputation, he saved the Israelites from his own destruction. Sometimes God is so upset with us. The reason why he saves us is because his reputation will be taunted. They will say, look at this guy. He keeps on going to divine kingdom Baptist ministries. What kind of God does he worship himself? So the reputation of God here was central to the salvation of his people. Saved from a terrible master. But their hearts and their worship was with other gods. They had clung on to other idols. They really never wanted to submit their hearts to God. Many times I think of us that God has given us marriages. God has given us jobs. God has given us families. God has saved us from a terrible place. If you can remember where God has got you from. And then once we get those things 
we start to worship those things. Start to worship those things. I just want to give you a small history of what took place in Egypt. And of, of the ten plagues, the ten plagues have a specific significance in each of them, which we may not go into them because God doesn't just do a thing just to do it. The first plague, when Yahweh turned the Nile River into blood in Exodus 7, 14 to 24, might seem like a strange first move. However, transformation of the Nile into blood echoes back to the innocent blood of the Israelites' boys drowned in the Nile by Pharaoh. You can read that in Exodus 1. Pharaoh filled the river with dead bodies and now their blood was crying out to Yahweh. You can see the paramount nature of the God who is a judge, who is a king, and who is a lawgiver. He was setting up a prominent case against Pharaoh. Yet less he be judged for being an unfair God. The Nile was the lifeline of Egypt and it was the primary source of water for human sustenance, livestock, and agriculture, and consequently, it was that which was fueling the economy. So because of this, the Egyptians saw the Nile as a deity and Pharaoh as a god who exercised control over it. So Yahweh's control over the Nile demonstrates his authority over the waters as well as over both human and spiritual power structures. In Exodus 8, Yahweh sends an infestation, an infestation of frogs upon Egypt which is full of callbacks to Genesis 1 and 2 as they are following plagues in Genesis 1. Yahweh brings order to the untamed chaos of creation when he separated land and water, making it possible for animals and humans to live. Frogs, because they dwell in both land and water, represent the undoing of his order separation. So Yahweh is returning Egypt to a state of disorder and chaos in judgment for their evil. Later, Yahweh tells Moses to strike the dirt so that the dust rises up and becomes nuts. This is the third plague according to Exodus 16 to 19. Exodus 8, 16 to 19. This is another inverse of the creation narrative in Genesis 1 to 2. Humans were brought to life from the dust of the land, Genesis 2, 7. And now they are covered by dust that represent death and mortality. Similarly, the plague of flies in Exodus 8, 20 to 32 inverts God's blessings to humanity in Genesis 1 and 2 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the land. And now flies and the one paramount thing about flies is that they like hanging on feces and that which is dead. Fill the land. For the first time, Yahweh separates Egypt and Israel not allowing the Israelites to be afflicted in the same way as the Egyptians in Exodus 8.22. A pattern he repeats in the decretive acts that follow. The narrative of Exodus depicts each of these nine plagues with language that's straight out of Genesis 1 and 2, 1 to 2. Making each one of them a demonstration of where well, is power that alludes to the creation story, inverting those themes to tell a decretion story instead. One of the things that the creator does in all the plagues, the nine plagues, is to show the power to invert that which he created. It was a strong demonstration that God can reverse anything that he created himself. And he did that one the, by creating disorder where his order had been. Was a show of might 
that was showing judgment to the entire fraternity of Egypt. The final plague is where our lesson is today. And this is the tenth and the final plague. Even the number of plagues mimics the creation narrative. In Genesis 1, Yahweh spends seven days creating the world, during which period he speaks ten times to create. Here in Exodus, he speaks and acts ten times to decreate. Before any of the plagues, Yahweh warned Pharaoh that because he was harming his firstborn son Israel, he will face judgment for that. Exodus 4, 22 to 23. Pharaoh refuses to respond even to his warning, to this warning. And so Yahweh inverts Pharaoh's evil and brings the harshest act of judgment of all, the death of all firstborns in Egypt, human and animal. In contrast to Pharaoh's utter lack of mercy in Exodus 1, Yahweh provides a way to escape his judgment. So Yahweh tells Moses that anyone who listens to his warning and obeys him by sacrificing a sheep and putting the blood on the doorpost of the houses will be spared. We can see this in Exodus 12. He instructs each family to bring all their household members and livestock into the house to avoid the coming judgment. Much like the humans and animals who gathered into the ark of Noah and were waiting out for the flood. This event was the first Passover and the first of the seven day ritual called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. A week that is still celebrated by the Jewish people today. But they never slaughter the lamb. For 15 years, 1500 years, the practice of slaughtering the lamb was there until Jesus was crucified and the second temple was destroyed. The slaughter of the lamb ceased because they never needed to repeat the slaughter of the lamb because there was the lamb who was only going to be slaughtered once and for all. And the sacrifice was going to be adequate once and for all for the redemption, restitution, and the recreation of man. Passover became a defining mark in Yahweh's revelation of his own name. And consequently, in the identity of the people of Israel and the history of the Bible. One of the paramount things that we see and as I continue to lay basis, when you read Ezekiel 20, you will know that Yahweh pursued Israel in all her years. My God, I've never seen a lover as consistent as God chairman. Yahweh, God pursued Israel in all her years. One of the promises of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit does not have the will to leave you. The Holy Spirit does not leave you. He said, I will send the one who does not leave. The promise of God is that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And even when you feel that the Holy Spirit has left you, what happens is that out of your own sin, out of your own sin, you have Pressed the voice of the Holy Spirit. It is not about getting more of God. It is about God getting more of you. That is what we call sacrifice and submission. It is not about more of the Holy Spirit. It is about the Holy Spirit getting more of you. Say that way around. Many musicians saying more of you Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is screaming no. I am the one who wants more of you. Yield and sacrifice yourself to me. I have been pursuing you all these years. I'm the one who created you for my own pleasure. But you have repurposed your pleasure to other gods and other idols. Yahweh interrupted her national life early by a 40 year delay before entering Canaan. By two dispersions as we see them. The first under the Assyrians 
and Babylonians and the second under the Romans. His appeal to return to him continues to this day. This is the view of Ezekiel 20. And it is reflected in Stephen Salmon 500 years later. Shortly before the second dispersion of for, or exile. The Bible says in Acts 7, 41 to 43. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol. And rejoiced in the works of their hands. But God turned and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of prophets. And you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of God Raphan. The figures which you made to worship. And I will remove you beyond Babylon. In Acts 7, 51, 1, 5, 1 to 3, we see, you stiff-necked people and circumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did you not, did your fathers, which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. Whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by an angels and did not keep it. One of the ancient fragments of clay. I usually I have them in my house. Many of them I go to Israel and I collect clay, pots, jars and everywhere and I kept them. An ancient fragment of clay found in Samaria has this inscription. I serve my Lord Yahweh and my lady Astete. Hmm. It's not a question of serving God, but of serving him exclusively. This clay, it shows that this person recognized who their God was, but still submitted to another God. They knew God they wanted to hedge their bets and enjoy whatever the pagans did. Monotheism was not the question. There is no evidence that Israel was ever confused about who God is. The tension was always on the issue of love, faith, and obedience. One clear benefit of the exile into Babylon was that it put an end to overt idolatry. Israel never again worshipped the pagan gods. God is still dealing with Israel in the wilderness of the nations. One of the things that God wants to have with his people is his work of reconciliation which he wants us to be party to. And that's the reason why evangelism is so important because God is a God of reconciliation. Ezekiel mentions the secularizing of the Sabbath six times in chapter 20. I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them that they might know I the Lord sanctify them. You can see that in 2012. One of the marks of the Christians of former generations was honoring the Lord's day by church attendance, abstaining from athletics, work and commerce, that set us apart from the world and was a mark of our sanctification. Honoring the Sabbath created the crisis for the movie Chariots of Fire, if you've watched it. The question that I want to ask us today is can we refrain from worshipping idols ourselves while we still profess to worship God? Someone today is on idolatry. The tenth plague was meant to address idolatry. The tenth plague was meant to take out the inheritance of the idolatrous. Because God was so furious about the worship of other deities. That he wanted to deal a blow with this and show them the 
path to full remission. Idolatry in Judaism and Christianity. The question I want to ask you, maybe you're asking there, what is idolatry? And I want to define it to you. Idolatry in Judaism and Christianity is the worship of someone or something other than God as though it was God. And the premise of the first of the biblical ten commandments prohibits idolatry. And it says you shall have no other gods before me. Several forms of idolatry have been distinguished. Some of them can be loud. Some of them can be subtle. But the question that I want to pose to you today is that if your worship is your worship to God exclusive. Is there somewhere else that you draw your hope? Is there somewhere else where your faith is ignited by something else other than God? What is an idol? An idol is that which is compatible with the last in your heart. The last in your heart is what the Bible calls an idol. What is it that you last for? What is it that you think defines you? What is it that you cannot live without? What is it that you seek to inquire of every day when you wake up in the morning? If everything is taken away from you, will you still be someone? If your education is stripped, if your wealth is stripped, if your house is taken away from you, if your family is taken away from you, if everything that you are and you're left bare, stark naked, is God going still to be God in your life? So I want us to interrogate this matter fully. So the last in your heart is what is an idol. What is that thing that really controls? It determines how you think and where you place God. The majority of you are saying today, I don't do, I'm not an idolatrous. I, I, I don't do idol worship. We're not here to judge anybody. We're here to introspect. We're here to ask ourselves, is that which I cannot live with? And how do I treat God? Is God my Sunday person that I go to get a high? If, is God still God if the breakthrough doesn't come? Is God is still God to you if the rent doesn't come on time? If the husband doesn't come? If the family breaks apart? If the healing does not arrive? Is God still God? What is that desire in your heart that caused you to come to church today or not to come to church today? What are the last things of your heart? What is that thing in your heart that you've postured it strong enough more than God? God gave his man of God a son and he says, let me see whether this promise has become an idol in his heart and he demanded the son and he said, give me your son. And God saw that this man was not lasting after this thing. I'm still his God. I'm still his God. So I want us to introspect and ask ourselves this question. This question is still prominent for us preachers. And if you're a preacher and you last for money, then you privatize and commercialize the gospel. And it becomes the merchandise to which you access vain prosperity. You start to walk miracle money. You start to sell healings. Everything becomes commercialized in the gospel of God. The motivation becomes money. And everything else becomes money. Healing for money. 
miracles for money. Sow this seed so that you can get this. Give this so that you can get that. Yeah, this gospel is for free. The average, the average believer doesn't, doesn't think much of God. And I can tell you this for real. The average believer does not think much of God. The average believer does not think much of Jesus. Jesus to them is a money doubler. They want God because they want to look good. Believers come to God full of idols. They come to God because they are lasting for a breakthrough. Coming to God because you had that somebody has received prosperity from God. So you come to church so that this God can give you something and you can be a, you can be somebody in the village. You can have a name. You can be called pastor, brother, chairman, chair lady. Whatever it is that you are. I've been single for too long. I just want to go to church so that I can get a spouse and I can start looking good. They come to God crying one thing. You say tears flowing in church but they flow for another reason. They come to God telling him, I need your help to help me fulfill this desire that I have in my heart. God, fulfill this desire that I have in my heart. Jesus, I want you because I want a breakthrough. I want you for me so that I can look like something. Do this thing. Give me this thing. Make me look like this. And it's true we sing it. Without you, I am nothing. But God just want, he wants to be worshipped. Not because he can give you something. Because he is. I am. Not because I can give you something. Those who know Yahweh know that he is. I want to be worshipped just because I am God. It's not because you can access something from me. So every time you come to church and you're coming to church because God can give me that breakthrough. I am jobless and I need that job. I am single and I need that spouse. I need something from you, God. Help me feel, fulfill this desire that I have in my heart. I have an idol in my heart that I hear only you can make me great. And even many pastors, they pray when they're about to preach. Not any other time. You don't want to stand before people and misperform. You're a musician. You want people to sing so that they can, they can, you, they can feel goosebumps. <laughs> Majority of the sermons on the pulpit are not about Jesus. They are narrations of the man of God. Superstars on pulpit not preaching Jesus but themselves. I don't care about you, but I heard that you have power. I will follow you until you can fulfill that idol in my heart. Then I will depart. Flimsy believers who they leave church because of an offense. Their ego has been touched. Their pride has been wounded. Do you know who I am? Do you know me? Do I know you? Church has become a place where you have to walk on eggshells because people can easily be offended by a sermon like this. Who are you to tell us these things? If pastor doesn't prophesy, the seats will be empty. We didn't receive anything. We didn't. There was no healing today. 
I didn't feel something. Those praise and worship guys, uh, and now they're exercising there. It's, it's become a house of leather. I don't think they worship anymore, child. I didn't feel any goosebumps. I didn't, I didn't feel anything. The praise and worship guy was, was staring at me right in the eye. He was not even closing his eyes. I, I didn't feel the move of God. I didn't feel something. Why is everybody receiving a prophecy and not just me? I'm getting impatient. Give me, give me, Jimmy. Maybe in church, they will cry because of the deprivation of the pleasure of the thing that hasn't been fulfilled. My God. God will deny you something and every Sunday you cry tears because he, he's withholding that very thing that will feed your idol. It's deprivation. Tears. You're like, God, when are you going to release this thing? Let it go from your hands to me. Can't continue looking like this. When is the last time you worship God just because he's God? They desperately need God for a prophecy, a breakthrough, a husband, a wife, miracle money. You need God for you. Even as a Christian, by the time you go to the village and you don't shake those villagers, you're like, what kind of God do I worship? How am I going to look in front of these people? The last in our hearts is idolatry stands as an idol. One of the things that I want us to do and as I'm preaching, I'm speaking to myself because even as clergy, we are part of the greatest victims of idolatry. What was the desire of prophet Ezekiel? What was the monetary advantage that he's required? What was the demand for the church growth? How did the man of God, Prophet Ezekiel, how did he want to be looked at? How did he want the nation to perceive him? What demands did he put on the nation? What nature of God did he want to drive? What selfies did he take? What demands did he put on God before God decided to use him? What was his level? His yield level to the Holy Spirit? Because also ministry can be used to transact the majority of the times. What are the dangers of idolatry? Exodus 25. Exodus 25, it says, You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. The one thing about God is that He's a jealous God. If you will not be absolutely yielded to Him, His jealousy will be provoked and He will begin to judge you. 
we are talking about the God who arranged for the procurement of our salvation by himself so that he can have all of you to himself. It's God who came down on earth, took his own life as a higher sacrifice, as a lamb during the Passover, procured you for himself, by himself, so that he can have you all by himself and in the hope that you surrender to him totally. Salvation was through substitution. A complete and total exchange where you, your will is no longer exercised. Colossians 2.10 reads, and you're complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. God doesn't want a little God here and more of something else. God is demanding that there must be total surrender. Based on the last in your heart, that thing that you desire more than anything else, I want to ask you again, what is the name of your God? Because the name of your God may not be Yahweh. It may be prescriptive of the last, the thing that you yearn most in your heart. Is it success? Is it wealth? Is it love from humans? Is it a family? What is it that you yearn more than you yearn God. So I want us to look at three things. Once we look at those three things, then we will find your God therein. What is that craving, desire in your heart that you're willing to sacrifice for anything and compromise everything? Is it your reputation? Your flesh? Your beauty? your education, your ministry, name it. What is that thing that if it's taken away from you, including simply even your mobile phone, that you feel that I don't exist. I used to be a guy who was quite defined by things. And God kept demanding all of them and he kept on leaving me bare, naked completely. He says, you have a certain number of cars. Give them out. G give them out completely. And I remember even when I was vying for the Senate seat in 2017. And you know, a heavy car. Because a God stripped me naked of everything. He told me, resign from this job. Meanwhile, that job I was traveling across the nations in bulletproof cars. Many things were accorded to me. He said, the first thing you do, leave that job. Then, then we talk. And then he sent a woman with a turban from Gilgil, from a place in Gilgil to come and look for me. It was in a security installation, so the gate calls me and they said, there's somebody here for you. I said, we don't, not, we don't, we don't receive visitors. Who is this? These guys have come to smoke because at that particular time, we were dealing with terrorism in the country. And I said, you mean these guys have found me here now? What's going on? So I looked at the CCTV and I saw it was a woman with a turban. And I said, these guys have become clever. So I said, give her the phone. She picked the phone and she didn't even say hello. She told me in, in Kikuyu, God has sent me to you. I, my at that time, my salvation was not even strong. I didn't even know God talks to people. I didn't know. Now I know that God talks to people. I've heard it. I repeat his words. He said, I said, God has sent you to me. How, 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 how? 
she spoke to me in Kikuyu. I said, okay, let me come to the gate. I, I, I went to the gate. And when I go to the gate, she showed me a paper written my name. And then it was written uh, the description of how she would locate the place. And it was the description of a, of a fire engine. Say, so is this your name? I said, yeah, this is my name. This is the sign that God told me to locate you with. And he says, I will find a big fire engine there. Kuna vitu za kuchapa moto na vitu zingine hizi ziko na ina ina. The first place she went was Nairobi Fire Station. She couldn't find me, so she went back to Gilgit. God struck her with an illness. She was in hospital for six months. She said, you must go and look for this guy lest I will finish you. So she was in Nairobi wondering. She was said, where else is, can I find this? Then she located it. And when she came to the gate, she was like, is there anybody like this here? She was told, yes. And then from there, she, she, she told me, can we sit somewhere and talk? I said, eh, I, I'm not sure about that. I can see this is my name. She told me the story, the way she had struggled. She can't go back without talking to me and whatever it is. I was like, this still looks like Nizile stories are Jabba. Because I was in a place where I was very paranoid. And so anyway, I was convinced. So I said, let's go and sit somewhere. So we went and sat at another bulletproof facility. I said, yeah, clearly. I mean, you've been searched. Even if you guys send anything from above, it's okay. So she said, but here there's so much spiritual disturbance. I said, how can you see? She said, okay, let's pray. She said, okay, God has sealed this place. And she told me the whole story about my life. Stuff I've never told anyone. Then I believed. Then she said, now I will go back and report to the elders. I said, elders, you're not one. He said, we are many. We have been praying for you. And he says, but the one thing I will do, I will be waking you up at three in the morning to pray. So she would wake me up at three in the morning and she would pray in tongues. And I'm just listening. And she would pray, she would pray. She said, okay, now I am done tutoring you. You have angels. So what will happen is that at three, try and wake up. The first time I was alone, I didn't wake up. My bed was shaken vigorously. I couldn't sleep. At 3 a.m. in the morning. German, I couldn't. And from then on, the transactions were aggressive. She came again. I put her in a bulletproof vehicle. We went. And the, was the, she, the things she was talking. I'm the one who scared her away later because... It was too, it was getting too radical now. And I was not ready for that radicalism. Because the transactions in the spirit were becoming real and I wasn't there. But over time, God told me, resign from this job. I said, then what do I do? He says, resign. Next year you have to resign. I said, okay, if it is you who is talking, because I'm still not very familiar with your voice, caused me to resign. It was my biggest mistake. Because it is true, he caused me to resign and it was not a good resignation. He caused crisis like no other. And he told me, you have to leave everything behind because I want to teach you the way of faith. So everything you have, everything that defines you. You have to give it away. Anything that I delayed to give, he put me in hospital for six months and all my savings and everything else dried up. And I remained with one Range Rover, which I couldn't fuel. And I went to a service where the man of God released his car on the pulpit. And then he said, okay, now release this last one. I said, what? I don't think that's you. So I looked around and I said, Ish. just before beginning the campaigns. And because he kit come on a I said, I gave that out. I was going to a political meeting in Windsor. I came, I went there with a paper bag. And the guys asked me, have you been robbed? 
I said, not at all. I didn't have any money at all. And it was stripping me of idols. Because I used to see a car in a showroom. Believe me, exclusive cars that only maybe four of them or three of them in the country. I used to see a car in the showroom. I used to fast for 30 days. I used to say, you have to give me this car. Convertible, give me this car. This car, this car, give me. I went to Cataloni to pray for a car and he gave it to me. I wasn't pursuing God. I was pursuing my own personal ambitions. I went to the prayer mountains. I packed juices in a Toyota Corolla that a company had given me and I didn't like the Toyota. I went to the mountains. I had Del Monte in the entire boot because I didn't know how to do dry fasting. It was my first experience. Day number one, I had finished almost 15 packets. Then I saw the way, where people are sleeping. I said, no way. I, I don't think I can sleep there. Ah, yeah, pan, pan, pan. I, no. I met their pastors from Kitui. Hey! Doing ministry in Kitui is not a job. Belt in a Piga 360. I mean, how long have you been here? I'm not going to 60 days. 60 days without food, goodness. Me, this is my second day and I'm not sure whether I'll survive this hunger. And then I parked the car next to the prayer boots. And so I had my list. So I get on the field and I do my list and I'm like my goodness I have over prayed. I look at the watch it's only 30 minutes and I'm like Ish. somebody's suspending the time. I go back in the car. This lady I met her praying. She will push 19 hours of prayers. Nothing personal. Help the education system. Help the military. Help the police. Help the president. I said, my God, Kumbe, this is the reason why we survive as a country. God answered all my prayers that were selfish. But from then on, there's no selfish prayer that has been answered again. He wanted to show me that I'm the God who gives. I'm generous. It did not last a week. I had everything I needed, including double promotion. German car, everything. But every tool he gave me, he used it to circumcise my heart. It was painful. He gave me a car and he said, this car, the one thing that you cannot do is listen to secular music. I said, how, Bana? Me, I was even, I even had a production studio. Some of the secular music you're watching, I was part of it. So I'm not going to listen. I don't have any Christian friends. I know Hope FM now. Maybe I can play. Then my friend said, my goodness, you have this car. Let's go to Naivasha with Dunda. I don't drink. I wasn't drinking. One of the things that God dried was alcohol. One day, done. So Naivasha, we are with the guys. I know God has told me, I've given you this car. Make sure no secular music comes out of this car. So I went to tune in. I bought CDs. I went to my house, broke almost about 2,000 CDs of music now it was me and my God in the car it became an altar so I'm with these guys in the car they love dunda reggae rock name it and they are pushing me to play secular music so the guy I was sitting with here I was driving and rebuking him with his hands and I had to hit the hands so strongly that you know I'm serious because I'm like what is God going to do on the road I have a covenant with him where came Ziki? Coming back from Naivasha, I was alone. It was the journey of separation. Nobody wanted to drive with me. We had two cars going. They cramped seven guys on the other car. I was alone coming back. Circumcising my heart of every idol. I thought there were going to be assets that define me. Carrying the most sophisticated weapons of war. Driving in the most sophisticated bulletproof vehicles. Having titles and going across the world and carpets are rolled. He took them all. And he put me on a hospital bed and said, I'm the one in charge of life. And he showed me the progression of life. Everybody who slept opposite me was a critical case. And he brought all of them to life. 
including one paramount case that there was a clergy, I think from the PCA church, who was sleeping opposite me in Nairobi Hospital. And I was, I was there for many months. I used to go home for one day and then I come back in crisis the next day. That was to deplete all the finances I had. We're working with this lady here, Carol, can attest to you. She's a ninja. When you see her there, she can give you nyongolo the way you don't know. Carol, you can wave to them. Serious security operative. I never ever went back to look for anything. I knew God had called me. He says, I'm calling you into ministry and into leadership. And you will never stand on any party that I haven't created. That's the reason why the first party I joined was a Gano party of Kenya. Everything that could define me. Everything. And that's the reason why politicians steal because money is their God, is their idol. There, if, if you strip them off those things, those guys that you call with Shimiwa, they have nothing to them. Nothing. Zero. They have nothing else to show. Other than corrupt wealth. That is their idol. And whenever you see a corrupt politician, you will know that they have no respect for this God. Even when they come to your church to give things. They are giving because it is in the giving that is power to them. Call to church. Call them to church and say, don't give anything. Don't. We don't want your money. Don't give anything. Don't give us zero. Don't remove anything whatsoever. Let us see. But again, one of the ways that God checks your heart is through your money. Matthew 18, 19 says, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell of fire. So imagine you're corrupt and you have stolen this big house in Drunda. And you have called us for Thanksgiving. If this verse is true, majority of us will be, would literally walk to heaven, maybe with one limb. German, siju yako nini ngekatu? Minajwa siju yata ngetembe yaji. Somebody would have to will me in heaven. I possibly be completely blind and my tongues and my teeth pulled out and plucked out. Because also, we have looked at ourselves the way we are as a source of pride. The objective cannot be you. You cannot speak or preach about yourself should only announce Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. What is it that Jesus Christ wore the pulpit? Where did he travel to? What were his earthly possessions? The earthly possessions must never be part of the message. Can we announce Jesus Christ only the resurrected Messiah? Is Jesus Christ in our churches today, in our homes today? How much of Jesus do you speak about in your home? How many entered the promised land? If you mean Israelites who are adults, when they left Egypt, the answer is two. Their names were Joshua and Caleb. As they approached the promised land, Moses sent 12 spies one of each tribe to report on the layout of the land and its weaknesses and strength. Upon their return, ten of the spices insisted or the spices insisted that it would be impossible to conquer the land. The remaining two, Joshua and Caleb, insisted that they had, with God's help, already accomplished harder things. The audience sided with the ten. As a punishment, they were required to wander the desert for 40 years until which that whole generation died out except for Joshua and Caleb. Joshua led the next generation to the promised land. Caleb 
in his 80s was rewarded with the city of Hebron. One of the things that God was so annoyed with in this generation was the lack of belief. They never believed in him. They never believed in him. They saw that their incapacities were too great to conquer the inhabitants of Canaan. Israel was never a desert. I keep seeing people making that reference. The Bible says the, the, the fattest of the land, of all lands in the world, none can contest that land. God chose the best of the best. But out of the many years of desecrating the land, it became a desert. But still, when you go to that land, you'll be shocked that it's not yet 80 years old. But the kind of civilization that is advanced there, the kind of security, you'll be wondering, these guys, every single week, rockets are flying over them. Over a hundred Muslim and Arab nations are casting them out to die. Nations have been born with the only philosophy is to kill and exterminate the Jews. But when you go and see the flood of hope, the flood of prosperity in that land, you will be shocked. But they know they are God. In Matthew 19, 22, a conversation between Jesus and a, and a young man. Matthew 19, 20, 22. Says, all these things I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. The young man had this, he went away and he went away sad because he had great wealth. The idol of this young man was his wealth. I want you, God, but don't touch my wealth. And many of us are like this with our king. I want you, but don't touch my health. Don't touch my family. Don't touch my wealth. There are spaces that I will not yield to you. And this man was not willing to give away his wealth. Salvation is not generic. Salvation is not something you acquire because of a citation. I receive you as my personal savior. No. The Bible shows us the truth of salvation in Luke 19, 8 to 9. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is the son of Abraham. Salvation, will, salvation comes to those who forsake the last in your heart. For those who forsake their idols. If you're able to forsake the idol in your hand, the thing that defines you, that is when you will realize the true salvation. What is it that are you not willing to give away to the Messiah? What is it? Philippians 3, 19 says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory is in their shame. With mindset on earthly things. NIV says their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. When the belly governs you. When you're able to do any sorts of corruption to get that job. If you can slip around to get that tender. If you can corrupt and use money to advance anything whatsoever in life. If you're not able 
to wait on God as your Jehovah Jireh, then truly so, your God is your belly. The last things of your heart is what the enemy will anchor himself upon and that they become your source of pleasure and your source of worship. And you will only pursue God as something that you do so that maybe you can look good in church. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one, hate the one and love the other, or you will devote to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. God calls those who do that the haters of God. So brothers and sisters, we cannot merely abandon church because of offense. It means your reputation is your idol. Because the healings didn't come. Because the husband or the wife did not come. Or because even they went. Because the financial breakthrough has started and it didn't come. Brothers and sisters, three things to consider in relation to idolatry. And this is a weighty matter that I want you to look at. Because idolatry has covetous, having or showing a great desire to possess something belonging to someone else. Grasping, greedy, rapacious, insatiable, yearning for something. Acquisitive, desirous, possessive of something, selfish, jealous, envious, green with envy, begrudgingly, grabby. But the opposite of all that is satisfaction. So the one thing that I want you to consider when it comes to the last things of the heart or idolatry, the first thing is money. Money. It's one of the most contentious conversations in the church. Almost when you're a pastor, you never want to touch the conversation of money. Even in relationships and families, it's like this. How do you relate with God when it comes to your money? Ways of acquiring money. Your secrecy with money. Your posture of money. Mark 12, 41 says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into treasury. And how many who are rich, who are rich, put in much money. God is interested in not just your money, but the heart you have towards money. Second Corinthians 9, 7 says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. What is your attitude towards tithing? Who did Abraham talk to to tithe to Melchizedek? Who did Jacob have reference to when he says, if you bless me, I will return to this place. Many years before the law, God says, honor me with your wealth. Where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. Look at Cain and Abel. Bible in Matthew 15, 8 says, The people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first roots of your crops. Majority of the time, what we put in the offering basket, the finance team may receive it. But God does not. If your money doesn't serve the purposes of God, then it serves the purposes of the enemy. Today I want you to reflect on how your money serves the kingdom of God or the posture that you have with your money when it comes to the purposes of God. They say when you want to know the intentions of man, give them money. 
they will feed their God. Where does your money end up to? What pleasures? Is it your beauty? Is it lasciviousness, alcoholism? Where you serve is the most. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And that's why God is very serious when it comes to how you use your money. Because he will then see the posture of your heart. The second thing that I want you to consider is your time. Christians don't give time to God the same way they don't give money. Because we were taught that time is money. One of the things I want to ask is that God gives you 24 hours in a day. And he demands a tithe of that every day. We see that in the life of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Babylonia. They always prayed for three hours. We see that in the prayer life of Jesus. He always put in three hours in a day. Even as fast as if we preach, if we only pray when we are preaching, we are truly prostituting the Holy Spirit because we only want to cut the Holy Spirit when we are about to deliver the word. The time that you remember Jesus or the Holy Spirit is when you're just about to do a powerful talk that's going to make many move and you're going to be a popular mega church pastor. Who is too busy to pray? It's only a matter. No one. It's only a matter of priority. And if you don't give God the tithe of your time every day, at least three hours, then you don't consider God important. And your excuse is that God will understand anyway. The Bible says that God dwells in a secret place. God visited the Eden, but he dwells now. You have to visit him. You have to visit him. That's the reason why we are in a generation of lazy Christians who are always look, looking for anointing in the men of God who have sacrificed that time. You have 50 hands that have been laid on your head. Different pastors, different prophets. There's a new prophet in town. Let's rush there. There's another one coming in Eldoret. Let us go there. There's another one in Mombasa. We go there. There's another one. Man of God, lay hands on me. Man of God, lay hands on me. And God is saying, I'm in the secret place. Make your time with me. But you will never. How much is your time? How much of your time is given to God? You want to come to church and rush it? But a football match won't rush. Facebook and tiktok in the entire day. The Holy Spirit has said, I will never leave you. He's there with you, yearning for your attention. God has time for you. Why don't you have time for him? Why have we structured God into days that God will remember you next Sunday? Maybe, perhaps, by the way, I'll come. If there's nothing interesting on Sunday, I might show up to church. Structured God into Sundays and into conferences. Church is a daily affair. The synagogue, when you go to Israel, it's a daily affair. It's a daily affair. That's the reason why the house of the son of the bond woman is a house of prayer. Muslims, they pray so much. They don't have any excuses. In the book of Mark 3.14, it says, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to him. The first, the very principal reason why Jesus ordained the twelve disciples is for companionship and communion. It was not because he can send them. He said that I might send them forth to preach. In the book of 2 Kings 5, 8 to 11, he says, And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Whereof hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought 
he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. This Naaman thought that prophet Elisha was going to leave the secret place the time of his prayer and rush to meet him and his offering to him. He was never ready to sacrifice his time with God. It did not matter the man was of what stature. Many of us, if we're just invited for lunch or dinner, if the president of a nation comes calling, if we perceive that it is someone important, we will sacrifice church, we'll sacrifice our secret time in prayer to go and salute the ordinances of mortal men. Elisha shows us that there is no man of any stature that was equal to surrender his time with God. And that's the way we ought to be with God. The third and the last one is your gifts and talents. How do you exercise your gifts and talents to God? Today we have something called evangelical capitalism. That talents are things that you are born with. But gifts are given by God. Again, with time. We are witnessing evangelical capitalism where richer pastors are getting richer and the poorer ones are getting poorer. Where the doctrines of prosperity is that it's the ones on the pulpit who are getting more prosperous and the ones on the pews are getting poorer. It's a misnomer. I don't know how this, even the worship team that was here, can they refer us to the shop where they bought their gifts? Can you refer us, man of God, can you refer us to a market where, where you bought your, your gift of worship? Kuna duka amwindi ambayo tuneza enda tuchwe. Today we are seeing the marketing of gifts and a price tag on gifts and that is idolatry. We are seeing mortal men prostituting the gifts of God. The reason why God gives us these gifts and these talents is for his worship. Cannot be anything else. Even if you're a footballer, even if you're a basketballer, whatever it is that God has given you is not for your personal and private ambition. And that's the reason why the enemy is into these gifts. The music industry, the sporting industry, the largest event in the US, the Super Bowl, has become an altar of the enemy. Because God gave these things for his own worship. One of the things that I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, as we close this, Colossians 3, 1 to 5. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then also will appear with him in glory. Number five is my emphasis. Put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed which is idolatry. What did that church in the desert not see? It saw the glory of God. But they failed to yield their hearts to God and they all died in the desert. The promise of the Pentecost wasn't manifested in them. Wasn't realized in them. They got a miscall because of idolatry. 
Their gods had let them loose, but they hadn't let their gods loose. Today, as we conclude, I want to ask you to surrender the last in your heart. Please rise on your feet.